Many thanks to Martin and to the Center for their invitation and their warm hospitality. It's very good to be here. It's especially good to be here because I found out an hour ago, or a little over an hour ago, that this is the room where uh, the likes of David Cameron and George Osborne uh, learned to sweat while they were taking their exams. And because I, I don't think they sweat enough nowadays, it's really good to know that such things are possible. You know, so we can, we can sort of think about that. I hasten to add that I'm honored, really honored, to share the floor with Professor Sidney Griffith. Speaking of which, I need to produce some disclaimers of my own, and this is a captatio benevolentiae. I am neither an Islamicist nor even a Christianist. <laughs> my field is literature, and most of my teaching and research nowadays are on modern Arabic literature. So my lecture will be, uh, well, it'll have a certain literary and literary theoretical flavor. Um, my learning and erudition do not come anywhere near uh, those of Professor Griffith, whose vital research underscores the importance of the plurality of population, belief, and mindset in the Middle East. This is especially important because this fact is being obscured and occulted at an alarming rate today. I'll speak this evening as somebody who is culturally Muslim, but also somebody who is very uncomfortable with homogeneity of any kind, national, cultural, religious, racial, ethnic, sexual, whatever. I speak as somebody who constantly seeks inspiration from the verse in the Quran, uh, chapter 49, verse thir 13, Ya ayyuhan nas, inna khalaqnakum min dhakarin wa untha, wa ja'alnakum shu'uban wa khaba'ila lita'arafu, inna akramakum anda Allahi atqakum. Which in the Tarif Khalidi translation reads, O mankind, we have created you male and female, and made you into nations and tribes that you may come to know one another. The noblest among you in God's sight are the most pious. It goes without saying that I deplore the now widespread forces and processes that move against the spirit of this verse, propagated by those who are pathologically allergic to any sort of difference or plurality. <clears throat> now, in response to Martin's important question about what is the point with all, with all of this historical study that's available to us today, I want to explore some of the pluralities in the historical study of religion, um, or rather, pluralities that, that, that history must necessarily involve. I will argue that these pluralities can be usefully projected onto three axes, namely the axes of invention, creation, and ethics. I'll be making this argument in the wake of some of the things that I wrote in the Enlightenment Quran, where, as Martin was kind enough to point out, I tried to survey the production and reception of the translations of the Quran in Western Europe during the Enlightenment. I focused on two translations in particular in this book, one uh, into Latin by a Catholic, Ludovico Marracci, which was published in 1698, and another by an Englishman, uh, uh, George Sale, which was published in 1734. But more on that later. Ladies and gentlemen, about 40 years ago, the French historian Michel de Certeau wrote that as an object of study, Christianity is not conjugated in the singular. The same might be said of Islam. Elsewhere, Certeau's provocative methodological point of departure on the writing of history, namely that history begins with the encounter between self and other rather than past and present, provide much food for thought. According to Certeau, the terms self and other are themselves historical forms rather than fixed entities. They are products of the writing of history, or rather of a history that is constantly being written and rewritten. Every history asks, what is the place of the other? And concerns itself with inventing that place. And here I'm taking the word invention in both the contemporary sense of creation and in the etymological sense of finding something from the Latin verb invenire. The historical process is constituted and informed by patterns of conflict and strategies of exclusion. Um, by the way, I'd like to point out where I've taken liberties with the translation, I've provided both the original text and the English translation. Uh, so those of you who want to nitpick can do so if you want. But where the, the meaning is fairly tra straightforward, I've just put the English text on the slide. So you won't be able to nitpick. So the same is a historical form, a practice of dichotomy, and not a homogeneous form. That which is excluded is always excluded from something that it forces us to redefine. Conflict hinges on the historical representation that it makes possible and organizes. The same and the other are therefore always mutually constitutive, and this mutual constitution comes through very clearly in the writing of history. Now at this point, it would be a good idea to say a bit more about the other and what I mean by the other. 
The term refers not only to other people or to different people. Derek Attridge provides a useful definition. Otherness is that which is, at any given moment, outside the horizon provided by the culture for thinking, understanding, imagining, feeling, perceiving. But it is produced by the same processes that produce that which is familiar. The other is one possible name for that to which control is ceded, whether it is conceived of as being outside or inside the subject. So one version of the other could be the unconscious. It is not for nothing that psychoanalysis is a constant point of reference in Certeau's work. At the same time, the semantic field covered by the other reaches towards the infinite. And here I'm thinking of Rudolf Otto's definition of God and the experience of God as being the holy other. So to return to Certeau, the very idea of a conflict between Islam and Christianity, and here I use the term conflict in its most general sense, as a term comprising wars, polemics, discrimination, and other differences, is something that must be inscribed in this process of the production and reproduction of the same and the other, which must itself be the basis for any proper history of our spiritual lives. Now, on the relationship between history and spirituality, Certeau has this to say. If both history and spirituality aim at coordinating a data sequence into a meaningful whole, history constantly creates through its operation an intelligibility of the raw material that it isolates and arranges. Insofar as it can be expressed, spirituality recognizes the fact that language hinges on that which is impossible to say, and therefore situates itself at this interface where that which cannot be spoken of is simultaneously that which cannot not be spoken of. Now, Certeau is thinking of mysticism here, but the passage between the possibility and impossibility of speaking, the inescapable necessity of saying what cannot be said, arguably characterizes much of the Enlightenment discourse on Islam in general, and the Qur'an in particular. If we place ourselves in the late 17th or early 18th centuries and adopt a super-historical perspective, we might well ask, what defines the sayable and unsayable when it comes to Islam? Can the Prophet Muhammad be spoken of as something other than an imposter or a fanatic, for instance? Can the Qur'an be treated as a different revelation rather than a false, impious text riddled with faults? Can Islam be thought of as something other than a heresy? And can religion be demystified without necessarily being despiritualized? Above all, how is it possible not to talk about these matters in these terms, despite tremendous pressure, institutional, social, political, and sometimes military, to do just that during the 17th and 18th centuries? The answer to all of these questions in the hands of some thinkers from the Enlightenment period is most emphatically yes. If we consider the two translators that I talked about a few minutes ago, Ludovico Marracci and George Sale, we find ourselves faced with a case study in some of Certeau's ideas about the making and writing of history. Ludovico Marracci was one of the sharpest minds of early modernity and, and, and confessor to Pope Innocent XI. He published his monumental text called Al Qurani Textus Universus in Padua in 1698. This publication is striking on a number of levels. And I think we have a slide here. Um, I'm not sure how visible this is, but maybe the next one is a little better. So the reader is met with, yeah, the reader is met, as I was saying, um, with a fully vocalized Arabic text of the Quran. So we get the words and the, the inflections, followed by a detailed translation followed by an impressive set of scholarly notes adducing multiple Arabic sources. Uh, the previous slide has, has a better example of the notes. Uh, and so in the, in the notes, basically, uh, exegetical and historical material is usually quoted in the, original, in the original and then translated into Latin. So we have all of this information. And then, unfortunately, the volume of all of this information is matched, if not dwarfed, by the painstaking refutation that Marachi adds to every translated page. That the refutation was the point of Marachi's lifelong project is evinced by his publication of a four-part four introduction, or prodromus, to the refutation of the Qur'an in 1691, which was then republished alongside his translation of the Qur'an in 1698. Despite the open hostility of Marachi's tone, in the conclusion he actually congratulates himself on having, and I quote, killed Muhammad with his own sword, end quote, and the often too literal quality of the translation 
The sheer wealth of the information contained in this translation make it a good candidate for the title of the first encyclopedia of the Quran, albeit a very hostile encyclopedia. It also makes for one of the strongest ironies of global intellectual history. At one point, Marrachi explains that in refuting Islam with Muslim arguments, he is doing no more than applying the principles of the 13th century Muslim scholar, jurist, and theologian Ibn Taymiyyah, who was often credited with being the master thinker behind several 20th century violent Islamist movements. Now, Marrachi's massive effort was clearly inscribed within the strategy of the Catholic Reformation, undertaken with the aim of restoring the intellectual and theological glory that was the Church of Rome. Another, tr another translation would shortly come along that was spurred and supported by the Society for the Promotion of Christian Knowledge, um, the SPCK. The SPCK was initially founded with the aim of opposing what was seen as the moral laxity of, the, of, of society in the early 18th century, but eventually, uh, later in the, in the century, it turned into an anti-Catholic platform. In 1734, with the support of the SPCK, George Sale, who trained as a lawyer and only had a private interest in Arabic, produced what I consider to be the finest early modern translation of the Qur'an into the English language. Although he did not reproduce the Arabic text, Sale stopped at nothing to produce a balanced and informative rendition of the Qur'an, so much so that the few anti-Muslim anti statements that one runs into across uh, in his notes and in his paratexts come across as being really perfunctory and insincere. The translation, which is copiously, copiously annotated, and I think we have an example, there we go, so this is Sale's Qur'an. Uh, there are notes and, and footnotes and footnotes to the footnotes on nearly every page. It's preceded by a very long preliminary discourse in which Sale presents the history and geography of 7th century Arabia, the rise of Islam, the history of the revelation and the collection of the Quran, as well as a cursory map of the doctrines and schools of, of thought of Islamic theology, all in terms that were as useful, sober, and objective as any 18th century reader and many a contemporary reader might wish. Sale clearly acknowledges his debt to the previous generation of students of Arabic and Islam, including Marrachi, by the way, but the results of his research and skill as a translator are unparalleled. Now, one of the most striking features of the Sale translation is that Sale is in constant dialogue, not only with the Qur'an and its exegetes, which again is something that he would have gotten from Marrachi, but also with quite a few of his own contemporaries whose work made it possible. His work is therefore really aimed at the Enlightenment Republic of Letters, whereas Marrachi seems to be only in dialogue with the Catholic Church. Sale situates his project squarely within the counter-counter-reformation, if I may say. He accuses Catholics, and by implication Marrachi, of misrepresenting Islam. Here we go. So from the, the dedicatory epistle, we find the following text. The writers of the Romish communion, in particular, are so far from having done any service in their refutation of Mohammedanism, that by endeavoring to defend their idolatry and other superstitions, they have rather contributed to the increase of that aversion which the Mohammedans in general have to the Christian religion, and given them great advantage in the dispute. The Protestants alone are able to attack the Quran with success, and for them, I trust, Providence has reserved the glory of its overthrow. <laughs> Now, the use of the word refutation here is obviously a deliberate, you know, allusion to Marrachi. The Catholic polemic against Islam is a clear failure in Sale's eyes, the end result being that Muslims emerge stronger from the quarrel. The insistence on producing an English translation of the Quran reflected Sale's concern not only with making it available to a wide audience, but also, perhaps particularly, as a veiled attack on Marrachi's choice of Latin for his translation and refutation. Sale's project should therefore be seen in light of the Protestant opposition to the use of Latin in church services, which was seen by some as part of a policy aimed at keeping the believers in ignorance and the clergy powerful. If the flock were armed with proper knowledge of scripture, the argument went, they would see the differences between Catholicism and true Christianity and shun the former. So what emerges from this brief history of these two translations is a reconfiguration of the theological space. Sale's translation aims at showing where what he believes to be real heresy is located, not in Islam, but in Catholicism. We also see when what could not be previously said becomes sayable. Islam is now described as, and I quote, a civilized nation, end quote, with laws and constitutions. This opening up of a new register in the study of religion is accompanied by another key transformation of the paradigms enabling such expression, namely that great medieval polemics like Marrachi's have simply become moot, pointless. <laughs>
You could really think of his translation as being the last great medieval polemic against Islam. As we think about history as a mapping of these constantly changing relationships between self and other, between the sayable and the unsayable, it's also important to take, to, to take stock of the part that creation and invention play in history. Although both translators use the same information, what sets Sale apart from Arrachi is that Sale allows the other to affect his thinking and his writing. In doing so, Sale reinvents the same alongside the other. Nothing, look, nothing looks the same after the Sale translation. From a post-Sale perspective, both Christianity and Islam differ totally from what they were before he published his translation. The very fabric of understanding is altered here. To quote Paul Ricoeur, another French, uh, a French uh, philosopher who specialized in interpretation and hermeneutics, I quote, the coming of meaning is the coming of a world, not just the recognition of another person. Sale's invention, if by invention we mean a radical opening up to the infinite and incalculable possibilities offered by alterity and finding his translation among them, allows the advent of this new world. We are not far here from the space of deconstruction. Far be it from me, of course, to describe Sale as a precursor of Derrida, but we would do well, I think, to remember Derrida's demonstration of what both deconstruction and invention have in common. Both are concerned with letting the other come, saying, come to the other, who then says, come to us, preparing oneself for the coming of the other, with an unconditional opening up to the other, whose unforeseeable advent emerges as the only desirable event. Moreover, the we, however defined, does not pre-exist this moment of call and response, we always inhabit a space of mutual production and reproduction vis-a-vis -vis the other. This preparation for the other is far from a passive process. It is part and parcel of what political philosopher uh, Castoriadis calls the imaginary institution of society. That is, the process by which a society invents, or as he calls it, institutes itself. Creation and imagine, imagine, imagination are, for Castoriadis, inseparable from history during the course of which humanity creates itself, its life and the social historical matrix in which that life is lived, and from which there emerges an entire universe of meanings. History is impossible and inconceivable outside the scope of productive or creative imagination, of what we have called the radical imaginary revealed in historical action and in the constitution before all explicit rationality of a universe of meanings. There is, in this perspective, no room for overly deterministic laws of history. And as an aside, I'll mention that when he wrote this, Castoriadis was trying to get over the rigidity of mid-20th century Marxism. Society is its own self-creation and its own self-institution. It is synonymous with the works of the imagination that create it and become the meaning thus produced. Society is the product of the institution, sorry. Society is the work of the instituting imagine, imagination. Individuals are made by society, by, are simultaneously made by the society that they make and remake. In a sense, they are that society. Imagination translates the raw data that surrounds us, what Castoriadis calls the magma of life, into the social historical complex that we constitute as our world. History and invention, and arguably revolution, are shorthand for the ongoing processes whereby society acts upon and recreates itself. It is worth noting the radical difference between the various ages of history in this framework. We are not talking about one age succeeding another in an organic or dialectical fashion. Rupture is all. Castoriadis compares knowing a given historical reality to learning a foreign language. One of his strongest examples is the medieval city which is a radically different entity, a very different thing, from the Athenian city-state. The latter represents a major discontinuity with its predecessor. It does no good to reduce the later instance to the former, or even to think of one as an avatar of the next. Similarly, it does no good, and seems at the present moment to be doing a lot of harm, to think of current Muslim majority states as contemporary versions of the medieval or early modern ummah. Nor, for that matter, would it make sense to use the ummah as the ideal for a reformed contemporary Muslim, towards which a reformed contemporary Muslim society should tend. Far from it. The contemporary state, in any of its guises, Muslim, Christian, Jewish, or secular, is in fact discontinuous with previous states and should be treated as a radically new creation. A society, that sum total of its meanings and significations, can never be properly calculated as it is constantly being created, made, reinvented. Understanding history necessarily involves this opening up to alterity, cultural and religious, temporal and geographic. <laughs>
Even Enlightenment's rediscovery or reinvention of religion in general, and Islam in particular, should, I think, be understood from this perspective, rather than being seen as part of an overarching narrative of progress. Gieströmsa's valuable recent study of the emergence of comparative religion as the new science formulated by thinkers and scholars in the 17th and 18th centuries demonstrates in very rich detail how the externalization of religion and its consideration as something that operates in the world rather than merely in the believer's mind effectively gave birth to a completely new way of thinking that made the study of religion an early form of comparative cultural criticism. Nor is it any accident that the bulk of the material that Stromsa surveys in this period is historical. It is only by examining the beginnings of religious behavior that we can understand why people need religion, and moreover, that all religions might be seen as multiple reflections of some basic truth. Whether or not we share that belief is not important. What matters more is the itinerary through which the, com the comparability of religious belief is invented, as opposed to the dichotomy between the true and false religion. And from there to more recent notions of equality, it is but a very short step. Nor finally is this alterity simply out there. One of the key devices for thinking about and dealing with religious alterity is the text itself. Um, this is the case largely because of our lived reality. We cannot reverse the course of time, but we can, through the mediation of a text, literary or historical, sacred or secular, acquire an idea of how things were in other times and other places. It wouldn't make sense to think of historical texts as ones that aim at transparent, factual reproductions of certain human, social, and political situations that have occurred in other times and places. The idea of history itself, I think, does need stretching. On this point, I'd like to return to Ricoeur, for whom every text opens up a world, a new dimension of reality. To speak of a world of the text is to stress the feature of belonging to every literary work, of, to stress the feature of belonging to every literary work, of opening before it a horizon of possible experience, a world in, it, in which it would be possible to live. A text is not something closed in upon itself. It is the projection of a new universe distinct from that in which we live. To appropriate a work through reading is to unfold the world horizon implicit, implicit in it which includes the actions, the characters, and the events of the story told. As a result, the reader belongs at once to the work's horizon of experience and imagination and to that of his or her own real action. To understand, therefore, is to understand oneself before the text, in relation to the text, in front of the text, to allow oneself to be changed by the text in the gap that opens up between oneself and one's other self. This distancing of the real from itself complicates reference, it is precisely the abolition of the extensive function of language that makes things like literature possible for Ricoeur. And of course, it bears pointing out once again that the category of the literary or of literature can, and in my view should, be extended to all texts that fall outside what would normally be classified as literature. Every text puts forth a world and participates in the complication of reference. What the text points to is never certain. This is not to say that texts have no referent, but it is to emphasize what happens when language moves from an oral mode, where a speaker can point to an object in the here and now, to a written mode, where such references are necessarily taking place at some distance from the moment of utterance. It is in the space of that displacement that the world of the text unfolds to reveal multiple semantic possibilities. The task of interpretation, then, becomes that of the exploration of the world of the text. Furthermore, the creation of that world is what makes every text poetic in the strong sense of the term. In other words, creative. Taking the word poetic back to its root, in Greek, poiein, meaning to make, uh, or to create. Ricoeur argues that the poetic creative dimension is present in every text, as witness the world that the text makes or presents for us. This is especially true of sacred texts, which emerge in Ricoeur's reading as being the most creative texts of all, the distance at which the sacred text sets itself from everyday reality and quotidian vocabularies bolsters its capacity for carving out a wholly other, radical new world. In the world of the sacred text, we deal with idioms that transcend the commonplace and profane uses of language. Even in the context of organized religion, where language serves legal and liturgical functions, the category of the sacred is opposed to the use of language as a mere vehicle for the transmission of information. This complication of reference that Ricoeur locates in the operation of the text is all the more informative when it comes to the difficulty of, of identifying exact reference. 
texts do not suspend reference completely, rather they use reference that break with those of everyday language. Stories, tales, and poems are not without a referent, but this referent breaks with the referent of everyday language. In fiction, in poetry, new possibilities of being in the world are opened up in everyday reality. Fiction and poetry take aim at being not in the mode of what is already there, what is already given, l'être donné, but in the mode of what could be, le pouvoir être. And to take this claim one step further, I'd argue that all texts, not just literary texts, move the reader into the realm of what could be. This is perhaps the most valuable thing about history, and it's precisely on this question of what could be that I'd like to conclude. In light of this textually based understanding of what could be, I want to plead for a historically informed ethics. The process of self-estrangement, self-variation, and self-rediscovery that constitutes understanding in Ricoeur's hermeneutics might also furnish a basis for an ethics informed by history. Notwithstanding the discomfort with historical reasoning characteristic of many ethical thinkers, think of Kant's claim that pure morality has no history, or more recently of Levinas situating ethics beyond being and therefore beyond history, it seems to me that you cannot understand the other without listening to his or her story. Narratives may not excuse their behavior, the other's behavior, but they do go a long way towards explaining it. One possible approach toward the acquisition of such understanding is the one furnished by Louis Massignon. Do we have a slide here? No, we don't. All right. Sorry, folks, no slide. One possible approach to the acquisition of such understanding is the one furnished by Louis Massignon, who argues that in order to understand the other, we must become their guests. I quote, to understand the other, we must not annex him to ourselves, but become his or her guests. The oscillation between the use of military language and the language of hospitality is deliberate, as is the ambiguity of the French word that uh, Massignon uses. He uses the word hôte, which means both host and guest, although I think his text leans more toward the meaning, the, the latter meaning, in other words, guest, uh, due to his experience in Iraq in the early 20th century, during which time he was a guest of the Arabs, during which time he perfected his knowledge of Arabic, and found in it what he called, and I quote, the communicable consciousness of the truth. One outcome of this experience, apart from his immensely learned and sympathetic writing on religion, history, and politics, is that it enables, the, it enables us to, and I quote again, see things their way, end quote. Now, seeing things their way is not a quote from Messignon, it is a quote from Quentin Skinner. Uh, the, ter- the phrase was coined to define the task of the intellectual historian as a way of avoiding anachronism and hasty dismissals of key historical detail. The danger of this anachronism in his eyes, in Skinner's eyes, was that it led to the conclusion that all which is not modern is necessarily primitive and irrational. From this perspective, we may not necessarily agree with the other's logic, but we can certainly follow that logic as a way of understanding the other. Skinner was thinking in historical terms. His alterities are chronological rather than geographic or cultural. But the analogy with understanding other cultures holds nevertheless. Messignon's concept of hospitality as a route to understanding and as a viable alternative to hegemony is perhaps best instantiated through the making, writing, and reading of history. It is here, in the world of the historical text, that we can imagine ourselves as guests of the other, or the others, in whose lives, actions, and beliefs we are invited to participate and understand. This is a way of understanding others that does not reduce them to the same, or disregard them because they are different. It is certainly true that we will never know completely and absolutely the thoughts, beliefs, motives, and purposes that make other people do the things that they do. And this applies as much to the present as it does to the past. That sort of knowledge can only be approached asymptotically, but approach it we must. For in opening up to the other, we implement a very important principle, namely the assumption that the other has something good to offer us. This is the first step, Messignon reminds us, of avoiding the mindset of the clash of civilizations. And the the examples of the historiography that opens up to the other are not lacking. In addition to the work of Professor Griffith and the names already mentioned in this lecture, we might mention uh, two recent groundbreaking works, innovative works on Islam and the Quran as texts of early antiquity that have recently been published by Angelika Neuwert and Aziz Lazme. Well, I'm done, so it doesn't really matter. Far too often nowadays we see a separation of imagination and knowledge. We know certain things about Islam, Christianity, and other religions, but we imagine them not to be true. One prominent example being the idea that both are religions of peace. And we imagine all sorts of things about each other, 
But rather than treating the imaginary with the respect it deserves, we collapse it into the space of hard fact without doing our homework. We say, I imagine it must be so, therefore it must be so. One of the most valuable lessons of history is precisely that it serves as a constant reminder of the importance of keeping imagination and knowledge hinged together, but not confusing them with each other. It enables us to track the ways in which we produce meaning, meanings and theories about ourselves and each other, while at the same time furnishing a useful corrective for those theories, keeping us on our toes about the limits of what we know and what we can know. One result of this greater awareness of history is the power to constantly interrogate what is in light of what has been or what could be. Knowing, for example, what a boisterous, pluralistic, interreligious space once, exi once existed in Baghdad makes it easier to imagine creating a similar space in another place and another time, rather than, as seems, today, as seems to be the case today, expending vast sums on damage and then even vaster sums on damage control, followed by still more sums on more damage ad infinitum, with no real vision for making things better. The power of history to suggest such a vision may explain the bizarre educational curriculum now imposed on places under the control of the so-called Islamic State. As you may know, the humanities are out, Sharia is in, and, and science is only allowed insofar as, as it does not contradict the teachings of the Qur'an as interpreted by ISIS. If history poses a threat to this criminal organization, it's precisely insofar as it teaches its students that things don't have to be the way they are, that they could and should be better. Taking greater stock of history might also provide some relief for the persistent tendency to overlook our own discursive past. I think we can all agree that the same terms that were once used to discuss race in the public sphere are now used to discuss religion. But there are only minimal reflections on this translatability, on the translatability of race and religion, or the vocabulary that we use to talk about both, or how this awkward translation transition came about. Finally, greater historical awareness on all sides might provide some relief from the narcissism that undermines so much contemporary debate and political action. The question that triggers most discussions nowadays seems to be, if they, if they are discussions, seems to be something like, why don't they like us? Why are they saying such bad things about us? When it really should be, where do certain ideas come from? And why are they still current? Again, here history can operate as a powerful self-cure, allowing us to bring about greater and deeper understanding by getting over ourselves, by opening up to the other who is within, around, and in front of us. History invites us to locate ourselves by locating the other. History feeds our desire for a better future by never falling silent about our multifarious pasts and presents. It is only by paying attention to history and its lessons that we can invent and even create that future for ourselves and those unforeseeable others who will come after us. Thank you very much.